third or fourth time you've heard me do the opening. Uh, what I want to do is do a filming, and I will show you how many of you have the biographies. I will also uh, read them. Uh, and that's acceptable. Well, even if it's not acceptable, I will be doing this anyway. So, uh, my name is Claude Destre. I'm a member of the faculty here at the Joseph Corbett School of International Studies. I direct the Human uh, Trafficking Center, the, uh, the our Human Rights Degree Program, and the Center on Rights Development. Um, and as director, it doesn't mean that I actually do anything. Um, the only thing I can take credit for is by making sure we have a terrific staff, and then they tell me what I'm supposed to do, put me in the right place, give the notes to read, um, and then they do the rest of the work. So once again, I congratulations and thanks to the hard work that countless hours of court staff has put in uh, to uh, make yet another very successful uh, uh, spring symposium. I was walking across campus from um, Discover Corbell uh, today, and one of the senior uh, administration of the university walked by and he said, my, don't you look like the epitome of a dean professor. And I couldn't figure out it was the cowboy boots, <laughs> uh, but I had like a DU tie, which I almost never wear, but I presume it must be the stash, right? <laughs> so, so. Some of you know the reason for this is that we're celebrating our sesquicentennial. That is how many years, folks? 150. 150. Thank you very much. It's not sept sesquicentennial, which is 700. So I look back into beard styles of 150 years ago <laughs> and at the same time watch the movie R.I.P.D. If you've seen it. So there we go. I had no choice at that point. I've had a full build beard for decades and I've decided I was going to with that. So this is, a, this is the new look. Get used to it. Um, okay. I'm trying to maybe uh, entice. Maybe we should make a rule for this year that all male professors at DU have to do this. That would, just, that would be interesting. Just one time. So anyway, uh, the Center on Rights Development is the oldest center here at the uh, Corbell School. Uh, one of the things that makes it unique is that while it's a professional center and run by very capable, uh, excellent colleagues, they're all also have to be graduate students. Um, I'm the only faculty person uh, really involved in, in the process. Uh, and my job is simply sort of a, to sort of hold the vision and mission over a lot of years. Uh, and But the court staff themselves are the ones who pick out the theme that we run thematically. We uh, focus in on the ICESER, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, is one of the three main um, uh, documents in the International Bill of Rights, the one that is least well known. And uh, we have done work on rights to water, uh, right to education, and a number of other topics. And this year focused on the right to health. Um, and the Spring Symposium tends to be a narrowing of the larger topic into, into something. And this year uh, is the complex care, the right to health in emergency settings. Uh, the panel today is on M Health, Mobile uh, Technologies, and Emergency Relief. And we have uh, two excellent panelists to share their expertise and their knowledge with us. Uh, first, a communications professional for over 15 years, uh, Michael Alexander has experience in both the private and public sectors, specializing for the past six years in health and crisis communications. Ms. Alexander has worked as communications officer with the World Health Organization uh, in China, Washington, D.C., port au prince and Geneva. Ms. Alexander is part of uh, WHO's Emergency Communications Network and most recently has supported the response to the uh, H7N9, you never get that quite right, uh, avian flu outbreak in China in April of 2013, and to Typhoon uh, Haiyan in November 2013. Dr. Uh, Chiara is from the University of Colorado, so um, I'm the chief, yes. Uh, so we didn't have to pay for a flight. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we always lie. Yeah, that's right. So, um, Dr. Bull is a nationally and internationally known expert in the field of technology-based health promotion. Her work for the past 10 years has focused on development, implementation, and evaluation of interventions using computer kiosks, the internet, and cell phones in order to facilitate HIV and STI prevention and self-management of chronic illnesses, including diabetes and heart disease. Dr. Bull has continu uh, continues to teach courses to undergraduate population and PhDs and PhD students 
at the University of Colorado at Denver in the fields of public health, sociology, and health and behavior sciences since 1998. She's also the course director for Theoretical Perspectives in Health and Behavior Sciences, a doctoral level seminar taught in the Department of Health and Behavior Sciences at the University of Colorado, Denver. So please uh, uh, welcome with me uh, our guest today, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Both. Um, Marissa, can you help get the other presentation up here? Yep. We could switch if you do each other's. <laughs> that would be very interesting. I think that would be very interesting. So, I think every single speaker has said this when they've come up. Uh, first of all, thanking you for having them participate, and also uh, saying how impressed we've all been, and I have also been with uh, every single, every single student we have met. It's been really terrific. I wish I had known about the school when I was uh, looking for my graduate school, but it's really nice. Um, just so I don't misrepresent myself, my background is in health and communication, so I'm not a doctor, and I'm not one of those um, guys or gals out in the field with a clipboard taking down the facts uh, directly from the field hospital. So, but I work with the people who do, and hopefully I can explain what they do clearly, so that's why I'm here. Um, I want to also explain uh, WHO's role in emergencies because that's something, until I joined WHO myself, I didn't realize what they did and I was, um, and I still find when I, when I go out and speak with journalists or, or friends, uh, family, whatever, there's still a, a misconception uh, of what WHO does. So does anyone here already have an idea? And you're not allowed to talk more because Laura worked with WHO for a while. Okay, please. WHO is a cluster coordinator for health response. Right. So, so what does that mean in terms of what WHO actually does in the field of health? All the varying agencies that are responsible for health. Yeah, I guess the biggest distinction I'd make is between WHO and NSF, for example, which is one of the organizations that sends doctors and nurses straight into the field. Uh, we heard yesterday they can put up a tent hospital. What was it? Three shifts of four people in two hours, forty hours, something like that. Three days. Three days. Three days. Three days. Three days. Three days. And that's not what WHO does. WHO is more likely to have had a long-term relationship with the Ministry of Health, and that's sort of our strength in emergency is having established relationships, lines of communication, and understanding of the country, and then working with partners. But I'll, I'll explain more of that as we, uh, as we go on. Um, WHO got that leadership role of the health cluster because of something. Does anyone know when the cluster system came around, the UN cluster system? 2005. 2005, and do you know the history behind that? It was the 2005 humanitarian reform which came out of the review of the humanitarian system. Exactly, so it came out of a big screw up essentially. So the way the UN and other partners had responded to the, what's that? Please no, feel free to jump in and to make comments at any time, it'll be more fun. But it came out of how poorly the UN system and the partners realized they had done their job in managing the tsunami. Um, and there was a lack of coordination and there were so many partners present. Maybe when there are fewer partners present, the lack of coordination doesn't matter, but when there are so many interested parties. So it became really important to organize this chaos somehow. And that's when the humanitarian reform process came along. And it's still ongoing. It's still a lesson learned. Uh, the most recent disaster I was in was in the Philippines, in Haiyan. Um, I left in December. And as we were doing it, we we're still talking about what's working, what's not working, what should we remember, which parts are really strong and really good, and we have to make sure we duplicate in each, uh, each emergency. So I'm going to structure the presentation around the emergency response cycle. Does anyone know what the elements are, what the emergency, the emergency management cycle is? Wait, no, wait until I see it. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> international or national? Um, they're quite similar, but let's say international. You probably have most of the words down anyways. Um, Mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery is how we talk about it here in the States. Exactly. Right. And I, I think it's pretty much that same thing. So what do you do before a disaster hits? That's the kind of preparedness or before maybe even making sure a disaster doesn't happen. Then there's the disaster itself. There's your response. Um, then it becomes recovery after that. And then it becomes mitigating the next time.
So the two of them, the clusters and the and the um, cycle come together in this lovely graph. You do not have to memorize it anyway. Um, this just gives you an example of some of the different clusters that there are. Um, yesterday, uh, we were talking about, I think, protection and also um, reproductive health. And couldn't, there's no exceptional one. There's no outstanding one for reproductive health, even though that's kind of a large issue. Um, Health is WHO, but there's an important distinction to make. It's at the international level. So when the, there are big meetings held on coordinating health, it's WHO. But that doesn't mean that WHO is always 100% automatically the cluster coordinator in the country itself. And even people in WHO don't necessarily know that, but that's an important distinction. I think it kind of keeps you on your toes as well, so that you realize it's a privilege you have. You could lose it. There aren't very many other organizations that could do it, but in theory, it could happen. When you say cluster coordinator, is that the same as we were talking about in the states as being the lead agency? In other words, everybody has to, you know, basically work, in essence, works for and it has to be Within. under the direction of that? Or is it more of a, an attempt at something a little bit more cooperative? I think it's, I think it's the latter. WHO doesn't, wouldn't have any enforcement abilities. And, um, I know that in Haiti, after the earthquake, the shelter uh, one of the agencies lost their shelter, um, lost the role as coordinator of the shelter um, cluster because they seem to have not been doing it, the job well. I'm not sure if it really was their fault or if it's just because the task was insurmountable. And in terms of, it's also collaborative and there are some other agencies that stand outside of it like MSF never, never wants to be seen as part of the UN process because it needs to be seen as clean and um, apolitical, so they always have access. So uh, they will come to the meetings, and they're usually very nice people and very cooperative, but they will, they will always make a distinction and say, we are not part of the cluster, we are attending it, or we're um, hearing what you're doing, but they make that distinction. And, it's, and now we're used to it as well, and it's, it's, especially if you've been to more than one disaster, you're like, oh, we, you know, just have to handle MSF differently, and you understand why. And it's also great that MSF exists and has the kind of access they do and the speed they have. So it's just one part of the puzzle. Um, so before the disaster uh, is, the, is the preparedness, what kind of things do you think would be helpful to have in hand before a disaster? We're taking, speaking technically a little bit as well. Not, not physical tools, but what kind of information would it be good to have before a disaster strikes somewhere? Find figures on, on, you know, health access and that kind of stuff, so you can see where. Yeah, the basic health of people, how people are. Yeah. Infrastructure. Infrastructure, as in. Information on whether it be the telephone lines, where they are, where they go, what they do, or whether it be internet communications or other. And for health. Hospital. Uh, exactly. Number of doctors, yes. Exactly. So that's all the kind of material that in an ideal world we would have for every single country in the world so that once the disaster strikes you just pull that down from the cloud and you're ready to go. It doesn't exist everywhere and that's something that's still being worked on. So mapping um, how countries are organized and mapping what facilities are available. And um, another thing that's useful um, Another thing that's very interesting is also getting a heads up on is there anything coming along, whether we're speaking about a communicable disease or anything else. Some of that's, uh, actually a lot of what I'm going to talk about is not high tech at all, it's very low tech. And when I first went to work with WHO's office, uh, regional office in the Philippines, I was amazed they have a rumor surveillance team that does exactly what you would do if you were given the job of being a rumor surveillance officer. Except for they probably get up earlier than grad students want to get up. But they come into the office, was it 4.30, something like that, Laura? They, came, they would come yeah. in super early, yeah, right? Before, super, yeah. super early. Um, and they would just go through a certain set of newspapers. They would look at the results of certain pre, um, predefined search terms to see if anything was popping up, for example, hemorrhagic fever or uh, just some any weird disease they might be seeing. So that's more communicable disease, but um, there's if you were uh, concerned about conflict as well, I suppose there'd be rumor surveillance would be useful. But rumor surveillance is something that happens, and then and then they report to the larger office um, if they found anything. Usually, almost every day it was nothing of note, nothing of note, nothing of note. But it's good, it's reassuring to know that there are people 
around the world who are actually doing that kind of, I guess it's data mining in a way. Um, there's also a more formal UN organi organization called UN Global Pulse, which is trying to um, uh, gather any uh, useful information and help generate more useful information on this kind of uh, surveillance that happens before a disaster or useful materials that can be, that people can have uh, in preparation for disasters. And um, I too uh, felt I'm able to delegate, and I have in fact delegated part of my presentation to one of your students. I think I'm very, very clever. Uh, Laura did some health facility mapping uh, while she was in the Philippines. I'll ask her to speak a little bit about that. Right now? Right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I was um, with WIPRO, which is the World Health Organization's Western Pacific Regional Headquarters in the middle of the Philippines. Um, this past summer, and um, when I arrived six months ago, um, the biggest disaster that had happened was um, a typhoon called Typhoon Boba. And I apologize, I actually think a lot of you have already heard my WHO presentation. Um, but um, one of the things that I did, one of my terms of reference, was um, doing mapping of um, where the health, the, the different health stations had been destroyed due to the typhoon, and then where they had been repaired and rehabilitated. Um, and I don't know, at first I was kind of skeptical because there was a lot of work to kind of collect all this data and like put it into maps and like, ah, you know, this seems like kind of a lot of work, a lot of time for just generating a picture. But um, my, my supervisor kept saying, no, it's great for advocacy um, to actually have that picture. And kind of once we had those maps to actually see how the recovery process was going um, was, really useful and then we, when we presented that information um, to the, the WR, which is like the, the head of the country office, the WHO representative, um, it, she was really excited to be able to see kind of everything laid out and I think not only does it help to see how a recovery process is going and how, how what kind of health resources um, are available for the communities, um, but also to kind of see where the vulnerable areas are, um, just to be able to see where, what got hit so badly by the typhoon, what is still pretty unstable, and you know, the Philippines is such a disaster-prone country, um, so it's just really good to be able to keep an eye, I think, on um, where our, our hot spots are. And another thing that we did um, in Mindanao, where this particular typhoon hit, um, was there has been a, a long-standing conflict um, going on there, and so another thing that I did was I collected a lot of data um, from since 2008 um, about, I tried to find every single violent uprising that had happened since 2008, and that was a ton of work, um, but what we did, we generated a map for um, from one each year from 2008 all the way um, to 2013 to kind of see where the, the violent uprisings were happening, and that's really important, I think, in um, disaster mitigation, um, because you know if there's a conflict going on, that can be really difficult to get access to that area. Um, so I thought that was really helpful and interesting as well. And actually, when I um, when I finished that internship and I came back, um, I've been trying to take a GIS class ever since. Um, just realizing how much the UN cares about these visual depictions. Um, so, uh, to no avail, I still haven't been able to do that, but I really recommend that you guys see if you can do that, because the UN wants to know. Can I ask either one of you, is your, uh, the data that you collect, is that open source, or is it proprietary to WHO? It's from open sources. It's ironic, I, I, having worked in the Foreign Service as well, um, Often you'll get something from open source, open sources. You'll write it into a report, and all of a sudden it's proprietary. Yeah, that's what it's right. Right. It becomes top secret when it gets sent to headquarters. <laughs> See, that's why I'm familiar with that yeah. process. So. Exactly. We, I think with WHO, it's more. Sometimes it's more um, because people have come from the academic world, and then it's mine. I did the analysis. It's mine, even though the mindset should be. Everybody should get to see this. So there's often, especially between the communications people or people who are more open-minded and those who are more um, the behind-the-desk types who want to own what they've done. So there's an interesting conflict there sometimes as well, where you're saying, let's share it, and they're saying, 
Not so fast, cowboy. <laughs> um, so, so this was before. This is some of the things that can be done before or when you're late in the disaster preparing for the next one. And so let's look at what happens when the disaster hits. So um, in fact, they start talking about Typhoon uh, Haiyan, or Yolanda as it was called in the Philippines, from around the 2nd of November. It was identified that something was coming along. And I'm sure you saw pictures of it. It looked like the hugest thing. It looked like a Hollywood movie. It was this giant mass that was heading towards the Philippines in particular. I mean, it passed over other one masses and didn't hurt quite as badly. And then it struck on, on the 8th. Um, um, and then it was really quiet. I was, uh, so this, I was in the same time, time zone as you guys, essentially. I was in Toronto. And I went to a wedding on Saturday. And we hadn't heard anything out of the Philippines. You know, once in a while, the beginning of disasters, you usually hear a couple dozen people have died, so I thought maybe it wasn't so bad. So I went to this wedding Saturday night. I got home, and I heard this figure, I listened to the news, and I heard this figure of 10,000. I thought, oh, that sounds, that sounds pretty bad. And I went to sleep. And then when I woke up, I thought, They're, I'm sure they've emailed me. And I opened up my computer, and sure enough, there was a message saying, we are putting on a full-scale response. Um, for the Philippines, are you able to come and be part of the communications team? So that's just my little side of things. In the Philippines, the head of office, Dr. Julie Hall, had been preparing ahead of time with um, other UN agencies that were in the country, with the Ministry of Health, just seeing um, what kind of preparedness there was. The Ministry of Health built up some airplanes with relief materials. And in case I forget to tell you later, they put in the wrong things. They, they thought the disaster would be less bad, so they put in what you normally need. Um, I think there was some food and blankets and that kind of thing, not realizing that it was so bad the communications equipment was going to be knocked out. So they had to unload one of their cargo planes, fill it up with communications equipment, like sat phones and, and all that kind of stuff, and then load it up again. So that was a delay that you, uh, that was a delay everyone from the outside is wondering, why are these planes getting up and going and why weren't they more prepared? Well, they were, they just weren't prepared for this. So there was some, that was some other preparedness um, that had happened. And then as of the night, the health cluster was activated, which means that there are all these rules that come into place when a cluster is officially activated. WHO immediately has responsibilities to hold the first meeting, to put out press releases, and then it starts monitoring, it starts gathering information, it makes sure it has the people on the ground that are going to be there and able to start, and able to start soaking up this information. And it's very low tech. They're making spreadsheets out of Excel. That's a lot of what they're doing, just recording that information in a way that's, uh, that's shareable. So um, what, uh, what do you think is, the, and you can't answer this one either. Right You're banned for a little while. <laughs> what do you think is the, what do you think are some of the best sources uh, to get information when the disaster has struck? As I said, for a couple of days, we weren't hearing anything out of the Philippines. So how low tech or high tech, what's your best source of information after a disaster has struck? Okay, you can low phone. I guess so, newspapers. <coughs> I think you can even access social media. Social media. Cell phone tech the SMS text. SM exactly. The almost the lowest tech it gets. Just someone saying, My aunt is in that <coughs> region and she says her whole village has been wiped away. So then you can start to get an idea as well. Anything else? Email messages too, right? People are emailing each other and telling, asking how everyone is, and I mean, if there's still any connectivity, often there isn't. But yeah, cell phones are some of the some of the best ways. Um, uh, in the Philippines, the Filipinos themselves didn't know. I was working with the Ministry of Health's Health Promotion Unit. You know, the people that make the um, the nice posters and tell you to wash your hands and so on. And so I was with them by Tuesday. So the, it had struck on Friday. I was with them by Tuesday. And they were sort of coming up with generic messages on uh, the fact that dead bodies are not a health threat. People often think they are. But if a body has died of, uh, in a trauma, they were probably a healthy person before they died, and they're not going to make you sick, even though it's very sad to see dead bodies around. Um, but so they're starting to craft messages like this. And then I sort of felt a little weird. I said, well, but how do you know that's what they need to hear? And how are you going to spread these messages around? And they said, well, we don't know yet. So we're just going to do what we can. We don't even know if our health promotion people in Tacloban are still alive. So this is already Tuesday, and they still didn't know exactly what was happening. One of the things WHO did, because we couldn't really sit there in a vacuum of information, is we sent um, 
uh, head of administration. So this man is used to dealing with um, new staff coming in and whether or not the cafeteria is being, you know, the whole renovation of the cafeteria and so on, but he was very gung-ho and ready to go. So he got in, a, he got on a military flight and then he uh, rented himself a car, took a camera and just went and started taking pictures so that we would get an idea of what, what it looked like there. And I think that's the next picture I have. This is a picture he took and we used it a lot in the beginning. Um, he just shot that out of the, out of the window of his, um, of his truck. I want to step back a second just to give you an idea of the impact. So this was, uh, this is from, I think it was done in November. Um, basically, uh, 10 million people had been affected as in um, injured or displaced or in some, in, in some way affected by the typhoon. Um, and, and by a, about a month after it, there were 90 Filipino medical teams on the ground and 63 foreign medical teams as well. Uh, ready to support. Um, you do a lot of guesstimating in the beginning. A lot of that's why it's important to have people who've been to disaster zones before because they have a sense of what is going on. And you need local people. This is why this is so important. We always think that the foreign teams are the first ones there because maybe that's what CNN will be doing a story about because it's kind of sexy and that you can talk to people. But you're shaking your head strongly. <laughs> the I mean. I, I, work, I work in the uh, United States sort of emergency management system. We always say it's the person who is there on the ground that calls 911 or drags somebody out of the, the debris and starts giving them chest compressions. That is the first responder. And they are always the people you want to find to sort of say what's been going on, um, what is still needed that you have seen. And exactly. Yeah, they're the first. Yeah, it's the same way as well. I remember um, I was in Haiti after the earthquake, and I remembered interviewing this beautiful woman. She was a little bit large, and she had lovely rosy cheeks, and she was a professor in the medical school, and she was very religious. She was often, she was very, she participated in her church a lot. And um, I met her because she was running a clinic. This is a couple of months after the earthquake, but I asked her what it had been like on the first day, and she said, well, um, the earthquake uh, destroyed her house, and, and so she was very scared, and she ran with others in her community to the church, and the church was destroyed, but the, the lot in front of the church was um, open, so, so people started to set up this kind of, um, as best they can, sort of set in the, set them, settle themselves down into this lot. And she said, at first I was a victim, and I was weeping with everyone, and, and upset and scared with everyone, and then I realized... Mm, I, don't, I don't have the luxury to do this. I can't do this. I'm a doctor and I have to get to doctoring. And one of her students, um, grad, one of her students who had graduated was also around, also lived in the same neighborhood. She said, we got to work. And in the beginning, we didn't have any kind of anesthetic, obviously. They didn't have anything to clean the wounds, so we used water, bottles of water, whatever we, could, we had. And they didn't have any cloths to staunch the wounds, so she said they used toilet paper. And that's how the first clinics were set up. Um, so then, uh, let me see, I don't have that yet. Uh, so, then, so, so then how do the outsiders start coming in? Um, the UN uh, people like me get called, epidemiologists get called, there's, a, there's already a roster of people who are available or for whom it's their full-time job to head off to emergencies, they start going. It takes a while sometimes for some organizations to decide they're going to press go because WHO has been caught a little flat-footed and too slow in the past, they have a new policy where it's no regrets. Once a disaster seems to be of a certain scale, you send people, and nobody gets in trouble if, you know, they accidentally sent five people and it turns out it was a smaller disaster than they thought and only two were needed. Nobody gets, there's no recrimination. So it's the no, no regrets policy, and everybody talks about it all the time, and we're very pleased that now there's no regrets policy. Um, in theory, the overall organizer of the of the UN response is the Office for uh, Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, and OCHA is sort of the way WHO is responsible for helping to coordinate the health response. OCHA is supposed to be responsible for the overall response, which they are. But as in anything, they kind of settle down. They have some strengths. Uh, some things that they're better at and some things that they're not as good at. And just as WHO doesn't understand why everybody doesn't want to be coordinated by them, WHO also doesn't really want to be coordinated by OCHA. So it's so funny. It depends on where you're standing and where you're looking uh, as to how you behave. 
But Ocha, it is good to have Ocha, and I think that also came out of the humanitarian reform process, the need for an overall uh, coordinating body. Um, one of the biggest challenges is, um, actually, I'm going to ask you, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, straight off the top? So everyone wants to go in, we're ready, the heart's there, and people are starting to move. So what do you think, uh, what do you think starts to happen then? Logistics. Logistics, for sure. And so what does that entail? When you say logistics, what are you thinking of? I'm thinking about transporting people and supplies, um, communication, getting what you need where you need it. Exactly. Yep. Making sure that you're working with the country so people can actually get into the country. And that was uh, with um, Cyclone Nargis. That was a huge issue. And they couldn't get visas for the, for the folks to actually get on the ground and get in there and get supplies in there. Exactly. Yeah. And, and before that process starts, trying to grasp what 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 uh, what is n needed and uh, where there are uh, uh, specific gaps needing to be, be uh, attended to. I think that's something that just keeps going and going all along. Actually understanding where the gaps are is one of the toughest problems. I actually had a question. Um, the, the WHO has those long-standing relationships with the ministries of health usually, and I imagine that I mean, some, com some countries have more capacity mm -hmm. than others as far as that goes. So is it a relationship where the Ministry of Health, health asks the WHO to come, or do they have sort of this standing memorandum of understanding, for lack of a better word, that the WHO is going to come in even if they don't ask? You would never do that. You could right. never go in if you're not asked. Right. But um, luckily, or it tends to be that WHO, WHO doesn't have offices in every country, but it tends to have offices in the countries that most need its help anyways. So probably if it's a country that can't handle the disaster, they probably already have a WHO okay. office there. And then usually the, the head of office will um, make a formal gesture, whether it's a phone call or a message, but will send something saying, we are officially offering help. Because you need to be invited into somebody's house, you know, or you're invited into the living room, but you're not necessarily invited into the toilet and the bedroom and everything. So there's still this, this uh, more formal, are you, can we, can we help you, do you want or need our help? Some countries don't want it. Sometimes, some countries think they don't want it at first as well. They don't want to be seen to be unable to handle their own problems. Sometimes it's for pride. Sometimes it's because there's political, um, uh, uh, difficulties and one side wants to be seen, the, the party in power doesn't want to show any weakness, even though it's probably a greater strength to be able to recognize your weaknesses. But So there's, there's sometimes some, some of that. Um, in terms of getting information, sometimes the Minister of Health is absent. In Haiti, after the earthquake, it was three days before they could find him. Uh, he wasn't dead, he was more taking care of his own problems, and I hope nobody's left tweeting that. And, um, yeah, and, and then there's also these moments where you're so, uh, so frustrated with the local response. I know that that first day I arrived, because you know, I just come from the other side of the world, how come you guys aren't more freaked out? They're taking their tea breaks and going and getting coffee and everything. I still don't know if it was because they weren't quite seized with the enormity of the disaster, or if it was, I mean, the people working in the Ministry of Health in the capital city are the more privileged, the more wealthy, maybe the kind that don't like to get their hands dirty, that's why they're in the office rather than being a health promotion person in the field, and so, you know, there's, that's also really important, but you can't push them and you can't stamp on their feet because they know far more than you do, even though you think you're smarter about something. Were you going at well, I was just, and I was wondering whether there was sort of a sense of I need to maintain some level of routine and normalcy when my world has been completely upset. Yeah. And we know that that's something we really encourage among our own communities is to get back to your routine, routine. as soon as possible, and then build in the recovery to the center of that. Well, I'm not, I'm not begrudging them the tea break, but was, there was one, one. Um, we spent one hour. Uh, designing a whiteboard so they could give information to the Minister of Health. Because the Minister of Health, they, they said, well, we worked with him a long time. He likes visuals a lot. He likes to see things. So they were like, well, where should we put like the dead? Should we put it up at the left-hand corner, or would it be better to write it here? 
And then they sent someone with a tape measure to see if the whiteboard in the minister's office was the same as the whiteboard they had there. And it was things like that where I just couldn't understand what was going on. But I think it might also be in the lack, in having a lack of information, they're just trying to do the best they could with, with, with what they had. And that's not taking away from um, what the people in the field were surely doing. Um, one story I have is, uh, I, I don't think there's any there's ever been a disaster where everyone has responded as fast as they wanted to and the news headlines were, best response ever, U.S. people die. So there's always those negative stories about why is it taking so long to get in there. Um, and it, and the, uh, air, the air base in Tacloban, they had, uh, it, as preparedness, they had stationed some soldiers there to be, to be able to hold it, to be able to help anybody landing. But those guys, most of them got swept away, and all of them got injured. And the one that guy that was left was injured, but he still dragged himself up and down the runway as best he could, clearing out whatever he could while injured because he knew that they would need access as soon as possible. He knew that runway would have to be ready to go. So I want to tell a story like that to counter my frustration with the bureaucrats in the Capitol. Um, so, yeah, uh, sometimes you, you don't have planes, sometimes your planes are destroyed, sometimes your planes can't get in, and roads are always a problem. If this country was an expert, high-tech, fully capable country, it probably wouldn't have had this disaster in the first place. So roads and getting in is always a problem. You were saying that yesterday when talking about water and sanitation, right? And then if you look at a country like Haiti, where I remember going to um, driving out, and there were cracks in the road like this, so one part of it had gone down that far. So you've got bad roads to begin with, and then they've been destroyed by an earthquake. Um, the other thing that happens is you've got tons of goods coming in, um, and uh, what, what's the rule that donors should follow, whether you're an individual or whether you're a, a formal donor? What's one of the rules you need to follow before making a donation? Exactly, ask what they need. Or give undesignated funds that can be applied to whatever they need. Right? Money has the most liquidity anyways, right? Everybody likes money, but, but donors sometimes want to give a thing, or, um, or they're sure that this country will need this, so they're sending that. But then even the right things that are coming from the right agencies, so WHO is sending surgery kits, and other organizations are sending tents and all of that. It's a lot of material. All of a sudden,